Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at the chi-square distribution. Okay, so the big idea or the main reason why we care about the chi-square distribution is that we can use it to model variance of the, or sorry, to model sample variance of standard normal distributions. Okay, well, if I can model sample variance for standard normal, and I have location scale shift uh, property on the normal distribution, that means I can do this, I can use the chi-square distribution for normal distributions in general. Okay, but wait, there's more. Because of the central limit theorem, we can even extend this to other situations where the central limit theorem is coming into play. Okay, so why do we care? Well, it works out because of these mathematical properties that are going on underneath the hood, we can take the chi-square distribution and apply it to other situations. And so if you look through hypothesis testing and statistics, a lot of times the chi-square distribution is coming up. The chi-square test is the first and foremost big example of this. And this is using exactly the, what I, the concepts I talked about just a moment ago with normal distribution and central limit theorem. Okay, so this one is a big one. This is an important one. If you are gonna be doing statistics and using hypothesis testing, you is highly likely you will use a chi-square distribution. Now, most of the time when we're doing the hypothesis testing, we get our test statistic, we compare it on a table or the distribution, we get our p-value and we're done. Here, we wanna go a little bit deeper. We want to understand where is that p-value coming from so that I have more faith in what's going on, I understand what's going on, and I can articulate what's going on. When Because a lot of times you end up in those gray situations in data where you have to make a judgment call and expert knowledge helps you, you know, make the right call when you're in the gray. Okay, so big thing, big thing first is that the chi-square distribution is used to model the variance, uh, sample variance, so sample variance of standard normal random variables. All right, so here is the distribution. Now, if you take a moment and you look at it, look at the kernel. So the kernel, it's a part that uh, of a probability distribution where you get rid of the constant and you look at only where the variables are occurring. Look at the kernel and I can see that I've got X to the power of something. I've got E to the power of one divided by a constant value. That looks a lot like a gamma, huh? In, in fact, you'd be right. Okay, so the chi-square distribution is a special example of the gamma distribution, and all the special properties of gamma come into bear with us also. So not only is this useful in application, but it also has a lot of nice mathematical properties so that if it is applicable, I get a lot of stuff for free that works things out. All right, well now what's the expected value? If I go ahead, I use the gamma distribution and I look at the, you know, uh, the shape and scale parameters, I'll see that the expected value is equal to N and the variance is equal to two times N. Okay, so how do we get the connection between the chi-square distribution and the normal distribution? All right, well, let's go ahead and do that. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna work with the squaring of standard normal. So remember, squaring of standard normal, right, that is kind of like a connection with variance, right? Remember, the variance of a variable is equal to the expected value of the variable squared minus the expected value squared. I'm talking about standard normal. So the expected value is zero. So the variance for standard normal is equal to the expected value of the variable squared, and the square is on the inside of the expected value. So that shows that I really want to be looking at squaring to get an understanding of the variance of a normal distribution. Okay, so let's take a look at z squared. So z is standard normal. The probability that z squared is less than k, this is gonna be equal to the probability that the square root of k is less than z or, or sorry, and, and z is less than the square root of k. So here I've got this. 
So z squared being less than k is equivalent to negative square root k less than z, which is less than the square root of k. Okay, well, at this point, I've got a statement that is involving z itself. Since it involves z, I can go ahead and just invoke the integration. All right, so I'm going to go do that. So remember, it's standard normal. So I'm going to grab the normal distribution density, and I'm going to do some integration from negative square root k to square root k. Boom, I've got it right here. Okay. Well, now I look at that, and I realize that the kernel, this is an even function. All right, so I have the same value on the left of, of the origin as I do to the right of the origin, which means I can cut this in half and multiply by two, I'll get the same thing. Okay, so here I, re I cut the integral in half, I'm cutting at zero, and because I know the area to the left of zero and the area to the right of zero are the same. So what I do is I just take this area to the right and I multiply it by two. So you'll see I multiply by two and then I get rid of the negative portion of the interval. Okay, so now at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform a U substitution. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and say that U is equal to X squared. Okay, well, it follows that X is equal to the square root of U. Okay, well, Remember, whenever I do this whole u substitution business, I'm going to have to, you know, modify my dx term. How do I modify my dx term? Well, I modify du. Okay, so I, you know, I need to take a derivative. So I take the derivative of both sides with respect to u. So the derivative of x with respect to u is equal to one half u to the negative one half. Okay, so now what I'm going to do. Everywhere I see an x squared, I replace it with a u, and I replace the dx with this u term times du. Okay, and so here you'll notice I've made the replacement on the x squared, and this part replaces dx. All right, so now I just go through, I do my integration. So I'm just going to go through, I'm going to simplify it, make it a little bit easier to work with. So I've got one over two square root, or excuse me, one over square root of two pi. I've got the u business and I've got the e. Now, when I look at this, if I look at it for a moment, I go, huh, I got a variable to a power and e to negative variable divided by two. That's a gamma distribution. All right, so at this point, I know that I have a gamma distribution. And so all the properties is coming to bear. So what are the parameters of it? Well, it's going to be a shape of n over 2 and a scale equal to 2. So really, I'm just working with gamma. That's all I'm really doing. But this distribution comes up so frequently because of its connection with variance that it has a special name. So remember, anytime you're working in mathematics or statistics or really any field, if it has a special name, it's important. And so this has a special name. All right, so this tells me all about just one squared variable, or right, one squared value coming from standard normal. Well, if I use the summation property, I can extend this to the sum of multiple squared standard uh, uh, normal random variables. All right, well, I can connect the invariance property of variance and the location scale property of normal to say that I can use this really for any normal distribution as long as I have independent identically distributed observations. All right, so, so something that is important about this is that we need to have independent identically distributed normal random variables. If I'm in that situation, I can use chi-squared to model the sample variance. Also, if I work through the details, we can see that the sample variance for a normal random variable will be independent of the uh, sample mean, which is very nice. All right, so if I take this fraction, I multiply it by 
the sample variance, then I'm going to get a chi-squared random variable. All right, so now let's take a look at the chi-squared distribution in R. So this is very similar to all the other distributions in R. We have our density function starting with a D. We have our cumulative distribution function starting with a P. We have our quantile function starting with a Q. And we have our random number generation starting with an R. All right, so X and Q are vectors of quantiles. P is a vector of probabilities I'm interested in. N is the number of, of observations for random number generation. And degrees of freedom are our degrees of freedom. OK, DF is degrees of freedom. All right, so something about this is that if you look at everything that we've talked about so far, the, uh, the degrees of freedom that make sense in terms of a sample would have to be you know, positive integer values. But if I back up for a little bit, I realize that this is actually a gamma, I can go ahead and admit non-negative uh, into or uh, yeah non-negative values for my degrees of freedom so potentially I could have like square root of pi as a degrees of freedom it mathematically works out now that doesn't mean it makes sense in terms of data analytics but in terms of you know the distribution itself it's permitted okay so now let's take a look at the density all right something I want to point out is that when we have the chi-square distribution, it is always skewed right. All right the chi-square distribution is always skewed right. And the smaller the degrees of freedom, the greater the skew. So if I have just one degree of freedom, then it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty skewed. If I have two degrees of freedom, it'll be a little bit less skewed, but it's still skewed right. Okay, well, because of the added property of the gamma distribution, the, if, if I, think of it as being the sum of squared uh, random variables, then I'm invoking something like connected to the central limit theorem. Therefore, what's going to happen if I have a large degrees of freedom, my density will look similar to a bell curve. It will still be skewed right, but the bigger the degrees of freedom, the less skew there is. So let's go ahead and take a look. And so here's my density, d chi squared. I need to pass the x values and the degrees of freedom. I put 30. And here's the plot. So I want to point out that you notice that there's more mass over onto the right tail than on the left tail. All right, so that is that skewed right aspect coming to bear. Now let's look at the cumulative distribution function. So remember, that's going to start with a p. So it's p chi squared. I pass the quantiles I'm interested in and the degrees of freedom. And we get a nice smooth CDF quantiles. All right, so remember the expected value is, uh, is you know, it's going to be close to the median and the expected value is equal to the degrees of freedom. So here we see that the medium is, median is 29. So that's not too far off from expected value of 30, a little bit of a difference, but remember it's skewed right. The mean should be a little bit to the right. And you know, here I'm just grabbing the quantiles for the box plot values. And it's a continuous distribution that goes from zero to infinity. So zero is for uh, you know, the quantile corresponding to zero and infinity is the quantile corresponding to one. And for random number generation, let me see the values that we got. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.